Hello, uh, my name is Evan Scott. I'm an associate professor here at Northwestern University in the departments of biomedical engineering and microbiology immunology. Uh, today, I'm gonna to be talking about vaccine immunology and design. Uh, this is part of the COVID-19 seminar series sponsored by the Northwestern Biomedical Engineering Department. So vaccines um, are extremely effective at what they do. Uh, and so shown here are just some of the, vac of the effective vaccines that have eradicated um, several very terrible diseases uh, throughout history. Um, and so what a vaccine really is, is training the immune system to fight a disease. Uh, typically this is thought of in terms of infectious disease, but it can also be used to target, say for example, cancer. Uh, there's a lot of research going on now on how you can target the immune system towards cancer, um, just like it is, it can be used to target virus infected uh, cells. It has had a significant effect on reducing the amount of death and morbidity across the human population. Um, but there's still some issues that we have. There are a lot of vaccines that we cannot develop, uh, in particular ones that are notable are HIV, malaria, um, and now we're trying to develop ones for COVID-19. Um, why is it that we cannot make some of these vaccines? Why is it that it takes so long to make these vaccines? Um, and that really comes down to a fundamental understanding of how vaccines work. And so today I'm gonna to talk about the immunology behind vaccines. Um, and how that can help us better understand what's going on when a vaccination occurs, which can allow us to better design vaccines in the future and potentially make them faster. So very critically, there are two main parts uh, to the immune system. And so I'm gonna give a very basic introduction to some key immunological com um, concepts. Uh, please keep in mind that understanding all of this fully will require um, a, a course. Um, I recommend in immunology to fully understand what's going on. Um, but I'm going to give a brief overview, um, start from the basics and get a little bit more detailed. Um, but I do encourage everyone to seek out some of the information that I have linked at the bottom in terms of references if you'd like to, to learn more about these concepts uh, in more detail. Uh, so first thing is that there are two main parts of the immune system, adaptive um, and innate. Uh, and so when you're exposed to a pathogen, the first thing that happens is an innate immune response. Uh, that's where you have biochemical and cellular responses that happen indiscriminately and quickly. Um, they're not very specific to the pathogen of interest, but they do have a very rapid and immediate response. And one of those responses is really critical, which is release of signaling molecules. Um, these are hormones of the immune system called cytokines, um, as well as chemokines that can attract certain cell types uh, to the area of interest. Um, and what this really helps do though, is activate um, key parts of the adaptive immune response. So what a vaccine wants to do is generate this adaptive response. Uh, and this can be divided into two different parts. Uh, one is going to be humoral, uh, and one is going to be cell mediated. You probably mostly heard about the humoral response, which is um, generating of antibodies, which is done primarily by B cells. Uh, but what's really important for developing va vaccines against certain types of, of, of viruses is a cell mediated response, which I'll talk about in, in detail today. And very importantly, the final component of a vaccine that's desired uh, is this generation of memory. We wanna have some kind of immunological memory such that the second time or the third time or the fourth time you're exposed to this pathogen, you have a more immediate and rapid response that can minimize the infection or even sometimes prevent that infection from occurring. And so shown on the right here are the two different mechanisms um, that are mediated by first antibodies as well as the cell mediated response. So the antibody response can bind to the surface of a virus, for example, and prevent it from infecting a host cell. It can bind to receptors that can prevent a certain function of the virus as well. What it cannot do though, is get inside of the cells where viruses might be residing. And that's where this cell mediated response is so critical. Um, so these cell mediated responses are carried out by T cells that are able to actually identify which cells have been infected um, and kill them. So it kills the cell as well as the virus that's inside the cell um, um, as a result. And this is why there's so much interest also in this area for cancer killing because it can identify cells that have become cancerous. And so depending on the type of pathogen that's present, 
either an antibody response or the cell mediated response or a combination of both could be critical for treating the disease. So this is a brief overview of the cells of the immune system. And I like to view this as your own personal military. I'm not gonna go into all of these different cell types, but there are many, many different soldiers uh, in this army, uh, mainly generated from hematopoietic stem cells that generate into either myeloid or lymphoid lineages, uh, resulting in a wide range of different types of cells that contribute to an overall uh, immune response. But there are a few cell types that I really wanna point out that are gonna be really critical for vaccine design that we're gonna talk a lot about today. Uh, and first are the generals, I consider them, of the immune system. These are the ones that are gonna be carrying out the direction, telling the immune system which direction to go, telling the immune system how to attack the pathogen. And this is carried out by antigen-presenting cells, or EPCs. These are highly phagocytic cells. So they're able to take up their environments, like particulates very easily, um, digest them, um, and present them. Uh, to different cells of the immune system. And there are certain cell types that are very good in this group, and they're called professional antigen-presenting cells. They're just very good at this entire process of phagocytosis and instruction uh, to T cells. Um, and the three main ones in this area are gonna be dendritic cells and macrophages and B cells, of which by far the most important um, are dendritic cells, which have generated a great deal of attention um, from the area of, of vaccine design. The second cell types I'm interested in, in terms of discussing today, are the soldiers. These are the effector cells. They're actually carrying out the function of getting rid of the pathology. Um, and these are the T cells. Uh, and there are several different types. Uh, cytotoxic T cells. Uh, these are marked by CD8 receptors or CD8 positive T cells. I'll talk about this in a bit more detail, but they interact with very specific receptors on the cell surface called MHC1. And their goal is to get is to find, kill, and destroy uh, these cancerous or virus-infected cells. The second T cell type are helper T cells. They are marked by CD4 receptors on their surface, um, and they interact with the MHC2 receptor on the surface of very specific cell types. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later. And their goal is to actually support the immune response um, and direct it um, through the release of cytokines, these hormones that are really critical for directing the type of immune response that is generated. And the final type I'm not gonna talk about today, but they're just equally as important as the others are regulatory T cells. Um, so if you have a strong immune response generated, you have to actually stop the response at some point or prevent a response from happening uncontrollably. Um, and that's what these regulatory T cells do. They actually regulate the immune response, inhibit it when necessary, and allow it to, to carry on um, when necessary. So all of these cells are in, a, in a, a naive, immature, inactive state most of the time. Um, but they have to be activated in order to generate the immune response required during vaccination. And this is where adjuvants come into play. And so I'll talk about that quite a bit, how adjuvants are really critical for activating these cells. Because without an adjuvant, you're not going to activate the critical cell types and generate the, the immune response that you like for an effective vaccination. So how does the immune system distinguish between self versus non-self? Um, that is through these MHC molecules. Every cell in the body expresses MHC1 on their surface. Very select cells, primarily these antigen-presenting cells, present another molecule, MHC2, on their surface. The, the, the makeup of these proteins um, and their sequence is very specific to the person of interest. Um, so the genes that express these proteins are known as HLA, human lymphocyte antigen, um, and they result in a high, a large range, a wide range of variability across the human population. So there's a wide variation in terms of the composition of these MHC molecules. And that is actually one reason why there's difficulty in terms of, say, for example, transplant surgery, transplantation. Um, these markers are different from patient to patient, from person to person, and they can be identified as foreign by the immune system and targeted and destroyed just like a virus infected cell, for example. So that is actually one thing that has to be dealt with in terms of a vaccine design, is that there's a high variability in this MHC composition across the human population. And so what are these MHC molecules actually doing? Uh, so first, the MHC1 is critical because it is actually presenting on the surface of every cell what, it's in, what is inside the cell. It actually takes the proteins that are inside the cell are constantly being degraded through enzymes, for example, the proteasome in immune cells. It's the immunoproteasome, which is more effective at presenting or generating um, 
these molecules. So proteins are broken down by these enzymes into peptides. These peptide fragments are merged and bind inside these clefts of the MHC. This is what the MHC actually looks like. So we have very specific sequences going on inside of this cleft that interacts with very specific components, amino acids with inside of peptides that are generated when those proteins are degraded. So proteins degraded into these peptides, the peptides go into this binding cleft and they're held there in place. And be between different people, they will have different sequences with inside of this cleft. Uh, and so some people are more effective at presenting one peptide versus another. Um, and when you have a certain protein, some proteins have certain sequences in them that are very, very good at binding inside these clefts and some peptides don't. Um, and so when it does bind very well, these are called the immunodominant peptides. And it's very important for a vaccine to understand what these immunodominant components are. So you can actually deliver the whole protein and let the body degrade it and present it through this MHC, or you can actually present or deliver just that immunodominant component, that peptide itself, for more efficient loading into this MHC and presentation on the surface of the cell. So that's showing what's inside the cell. What's really unique about those antigen-presenting cells, they can also show what's on the outside of the cell, what's surrounding uh, in the surrounding fluids. Um, and that's through the MHC2. And so when the endocytos or the phagocytos in particulates from the outside, like a virus or a bacteria, it digests it and takes those components from that foreign um, protein, from that foreign pathogen, and presents that on the surface of the cell as well. And so through these different systems, you can see things that are on the outside and things that are on the inside of the cell. And you can tell if there's something foreign or that shouldn't be there being presented. So it's essentially like a marking system to determine when there's something that should and should not be there on the surface of the cell. And so keep in mind, this is going on all the time with your own self proteins. So most of the time, MHC1 is being presented, presenting these, these peptides on their surface and nothing is happening. It's actually tolerizing and protecting you from the immune response. That's why there has to be an adjuvant present to signal when the foreign protein that's being presented or peptide being presented is actually dangerous and should be mounting an immune response. So what are these markers that are identified uh, inside these pathogens? Um, and this is where the antigen comes in. So you can think of an antigen as anything that can generate or trigger an immune response. It could be a protein. Sometimes it's considered the entire virus can be considered an antigen. Um, but there's key parts of these that actually generate that response, and those are the epitopes. Those are distinctive markers and targets. So for example, the antibody will bind to the epitope uh, within inside of this entire antigen. And so this one antigen can have multiple epitopes, multiple, spark, multiple ways of generating the immune response, and it can have multiple antibodies bind, different types of antibodies bind to different locations. So what are those two different components that are really critical? Again, those are humoral and cell-mediated. Um, and so humorals, which a lot of people are more familiar with in terms of immune response, you think about generating antibodies. How is that antibody response generated? And those are done by B cells, which of course are antigen presenting cells. Um, and all, what's very unique about them is that on their surface is they actually have receptors called BCRs, B cell receptors, that are actually antibodies, membrane bound antibodies. And so different B cells have different specificities through these antibodies, the different types of antibodies and specificity on their surfaces. So some of them will actually bind to these epitopes in an antigen. And when that happens, the B cell knows that, okay, I've bound something that shouldn't be here. I found something foreign. I'm now going to differentiate into a plasma cell and just start making soluble forms of this antibody as many as I can. Uh, so these antibodies are being generated uh, due to the binding of this surface membrane uh, bound to antibody initially to these antigens or these epitopes, generating these plasma cells that now can differentiate out and make many, many different, many, many, many um, antibodies. And each B cell is going to generate one type of antibody. And that's usually seen as, as or called a monoclonal antibody response. So it's specific for one of these epitopes. Um, so this is just an example of an antigen that has three separate an uh, epitopes on its surface. So this monoclonal response from one type of B cell is going to generate this one antibody that binds that one epitope. And what's more commonly seen is a polyclonal response because an antigen has many different epitopes in it, and you can generate many antibodies, each one binding to a different uh, epitope. So that's the humoral component. So what is that cell-mediated component, the cell-mediated immunity? It's a cytotoxic response where we have these CD8-positive T cells 
going out and finding those foreign cells, those foreign um, those cells infected with foreign pathogens um, and destroying them. Uh, so for example, we have a target cell here that's infected by a virus. The virus is inside of its cytosol, so it's presenting on its surface some virus-specific peptides um, in complex with that MHC as shown here. And this T cell has a receptor called the TCR that's going to bind specifically to that MHC as well as to that unique antigen. And so when that happens, the T cell has a variety of different methods of actually killing that target cell. Uh, one of those commonly known is this mechanism using porphyrin and granzyme B. Uh, perforin perforin um, is inside of these endosomal um, vesicles or vacuoles inside of the cell. It releases um, very close to the cell surface. So the T cell comes up to the target cell, binds to it, um, releases perforin, which causes pores to open up inside of the membrane of the target cell. And then granzyme B, this enzyme is released that goes inside and actually starts able to digest proteins inside of the target cell and induce controlled apoptosis. So essentially this T cell goes out, finds an infected cell and causes it to undergo apoptosis and to die. Now, whether or not you have a humor response or this cell-mediated response is dependent on this ratio of what's called a Th1 versus a Th2 response. And that corresponds to those helper cells, those helper T cells. So I talked about the CD8 positive cells, those are cytotoxic, the CD4 helper cells that are CD4 positive, not CD8 positive. Um, these actually are responsible for generating key cytokines and hormones in the immune system to be released. And depending on the types and mixtures of these cytokines, you'll have a different type of immune response. And these are the main general form. There's actually more types of immune response you can have, but these are the main ones that are important for uh, vaccine responses are going to be TH1 response and a TH2 response. So that TH1 response is what I just talked about, which was the CD8 positive T cell cytotoxic response. This is marked by interferon gamma, IL-12, TF alpha being released. Um, but what's important for a humoral response is this TH2 response. And this is, has a different repertoire of cytokines, IL-4, IL-5, IL-13. Uh, and the, the key cytokines for each of these um, are IL-12 for TH1 and IL-4 for TH2. And what's really interesting about this is that this system polarizes. So typically when you have a strong humoral response, you'll have a weak cytotoxic response. And that's shown here. So here we have a strong cell media response and it corresponds to a weak humoral response, and you can have vice versa. And the reason for that is that many of these cytokines that are expressed actually inhibit the other pathway. So IL-12, for example, is inhibitory towards TH2, IL-4 is inhibitory towards TH1. So this results in a critical com concept of polarization. So when you have a vaccine, you want to polarize that response to, do you want TH2 for strong humoral response? Do you want TH1 for strong cytotoxic response? It's also important to realize that these helper cells are critical for both cytotoxic and humoral. Um, so the types of cytokines that are released will support the cytotoxic response or will support a humoral response. So it's actually critical to actually have mixtures sometimes of these cytokines for some of so a more broad uh, immune response that can occur. So those are the basic principles of what happens during vaccination. So now I want to get into a little bit more detail about some of the key immunological principles that kind of dictate what happens um, when you have a vaccine response. So that's big picture. Now I want to get into a little bit more of, of the detail. So first is that um, there are very critical cells that we are interested in that are located in very specific locations within the body. Uh, so the key cells, as I mentioned before, are th these APCs, particularly the dendritic cell and the T cells. Uh, so shown here is what's called the immune synapse, immuno immunological synapse that happens between dendritic cells and T cells um, during activation. Uh, so this dendritic cell has become activated. Um, you see these dendrites coming out and it's now binding to a T cell and instructing it into what it has to do. What should it differentiate into? Should it be TH1? Should it be TH2 type of pathway? And so these cells are located, the dendritic cells are located throughout the body. Um, but there are certain locations that have extremely high concentrations of them where they carry out most of these functions. And these are secondary lymphoid organs. Um, and this is the lymph node is, a, is the main one for vaccination, but also you'll find them in the liver, you'll find them in the spleen, the tonsils. Um, 
many different locations throughout the body. But for vaccine design, usually the lymph nodes um, is the key target. And one reason for that uh, is the fact that when you have blood circulating to organs, before that blood goes back into circulation, it gets filtered through the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system drains fluids from the tissues back into circulation and connected with inside the lymph lymphatic system are these lymph nodes. So as it starts to drain back into um, the circulation, it goes through these essentially filters um, that exposes these key high concentrations of these key immune cells to any kind of particulate, anything that's inside of that, of that, that uh, fluid that shouldn't be there. So when you have an injection from a vaccine, the vaccine components will drain through lymphatics into this lymph node to interact uh, with these cells. So here's a breakdown of the different types of APCs. Um, again, the most important ones are these professional APCs, antigen-presenting cells, which are dendritic cells and macrophages. Um, they are highly phagocytic, which is really critical for them to be able to take up those particulates from your vaccine, as well as from any kind of, say, local tissue inflammation that's going on. They're activated by damaging the tissue, so danger-associated molecular patterns and pathogen-associated molecular patterns. These are key things that are associated with either a pathogen or damaged tissue that activates um, those cells. They're located throughout the body in many different tissues. They're kind of like sentinels. They're looking around for anything that shouldn't be there. Um, and then they go back to those lymph nodes um, and instruct those T cells um, that they found a target, something that needs to be destroyed. And really important for them is that they express those MHC2 molecules. Most cells in the body do not express the MHC2. C2. Most cells express MHC1, but not MHC2. That's very unique to these antigen-presenting cell types. Another thing is that these antigen presenting cells express co-receptors, which I'll talk about in a lot of detail because um, that's really critical for how they instruct the T cells um, to function. And so these are the main ones. There are some other ones I'm not going to talk about, these atypical APCs, but endothelial cells, mast cells, basophils, all these different other cell types, they can also have functions um, similar to APCs. Many of them require being induced to do these functions or they do it in a weaker, uh, weaker version or not as effective. Not as effective. So this is what is one critical component of these cells, that they're highly, highly phagocytic. So most cells undergo endocytosis in terms of they take in something from the outside into the inside of the cell, and that's usually re receptor mediated. It re requires a receptor to bind to something and transfers it into the cell. Um, in the case of these APCs, that's not always required. So they have, first they have a wide repertoire of receptors that allows them to take in many different things. Um, and particularly to have this phagocytosis pathway, which allows them to take in extremely large particulates, as well as scavenger receptors that can take in a wide different range of surface chemistries that can be present on these different bacterium and viruses. But very importantly, they undergo macropenocytosis, which is a non-specific uptake. It does not require a receptor. They're just constantly sampling everything around them. So when you have a vaccine injected, it doesn't have to actually bind or interact with any receptor in these cells. These cells can just be in the location and just be taking in and sampling their environment and take in the components um, into their interior for processing. And this is just an electron microscopy showing a dendritic cell with all these different vacuoles in it and showing that it's actually taking in um, a foreign material, in this case a nanoparticle, inside of when it's this process is here, it's going to be taken into the cell for processing. And this shows that they're extremely versatile in terms of how they can actually um, engulf and endocytose these particulates. So this is strangely shaped or um, high aspect ratio particles to investigate this process. You can see that even though these particles are extremely large, these are micron scale particles, um, these dendritic cells, these macrophages will still in, attempt to fully engulf them and take them in even if they, they cannot. So this actually brings up a, a different definition of vaccination, um, which more specifically is training the immune system by targeting antigen and adjuvant to specifically these antigen presenting cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, uh, and B cells. So again, the antigen is a component of that, fo of that foreign pathogen that's the target. Um, and second, that adjuvant is that signal that says something is wrong here and you need to, t to find and destroy anything associated with that target antigen. And so really importantly, if you don't have that of adjuvant, you will not have a pro-inflammatory response. Your vaccine will not work. So we talk about how, many, a lot of people talk about how vaccines are dangerous and there's a lot of fear about the adjuvants present in vaccines. Um, a vaccine will not work without adjuvant being present. They are essential to the vaccine working and 
they are not dangerous. Um, to be honest, you're being exposed to adjuvants all the time because I'll talk about this in more detail, but the adjuvants are essentially components of a pathogen. Um, their lipid membrane, their cell membrane, um, protein, their DNA, all of these can function as an adjuvant. So anytime your body naturally gets rid of um, an infection, it is interacting with adjuvants that came from that pathogen itself. So it's completely normal to be exposed to adjuvants on a regular basis. And this is just an example of a dendritic cell taking in um, fungal particles, this endocytosis or phagocytosis process shown here. And once they become stimulated, they actually change their structure they extend these dendrites that increases their surface area, allows them to interact with T cells. So quickly, I'm going to share with you a video um, that shows what happens once these cells become activated. Okay, uh, so shown here um, is microscopy of dendritic cells interacting um, with T cells. And so shown here, you see these processes coming out, these dendrites extending from um, extending from uh, these, these cells to allow them to interact with T cells and to actually increase in surface area. And so one single dendritic cell can actually interact with dozens and dozens of T cells many times at once. Uh, so shown here are, is a co-culture of dendritic cells with T cells. And so you'll see here is a dendritic cell interacting with these T cells and you'll see a large number of these T cells aggregated um, on their surfaces, all being activated and stimulated by different components and receptors being expressed uh, on the surface of, of that dendritic cell. So this dendritic cell is now instructing all these T cells associated with it what to do in terms of uh, mounting an immune response. It all depends on what was given um, to those dendritic cells, what kind of pathogens, and pathogens they interacted with, what kind of proteins and adjuvants they processed. So now I'm going to shift back to the presentation. And so I have a link here at the bottom um, so you can actually see that video um, if, it, if you're interested in seeing more. YouTube has many different videos showing this process occurring. So these dendritic cells are not just targets for vaccination. They're targets for many different types of therapies where you want to modulate an immune response. And this is where it's very critical that we understand what we're putting in our vaccine and giving to these dendritic cells, because they will process these things and give out different kinds of immune response. So if given the improper signal, they can actually have the opposite effects of what you want in terms of a vaccine. Very unique about these cells, these dendritic cells, they control both the inflammatory and the anti-inflammatory components uh, of the immune system. So when they take in these foreign pathogens, um, your vaccine, your delivery system, your nanoparticles, along with the adjuvant, they'll take them inside, process them, uh, make those peptides that present on the surface with the MHC. They'll take the adjuvant and they'll be stimulated by them and start to have co-stimulatory molecule expression on their surface to interact with um, the effector cells. And these signals, along with cytokines that are expressed in response to those adjuvants, these signals will instruct the T cells to become effector T cells and carry out a certain function. If you don't have those adjuvant signals, you will not have the co-receptor expression. And these MHC will present that antigen um, without that co-receptor stimulation and with different cytokines resulting in different T cell stimulation. You'll now start to get regulatory T cells activated. And so this is not a bad thing completely. It is bad for a vaccine. You don't really want to tolerize against the, the components of a pathogen during a vaccination, but it's very useful for things like organ transplantation, heart disease, autoimmune disorders. So this is why it's very critical to understand what you're putting into your vaccine formulation, what you're giving to the dendritic cells, and how you're instructed them to guide an immune response. So what is really unique about an immune response, um, what I find very interesting, is that different, different pathogens will mount a very controlled and very specific response that's a function of their composition as well as their structure. So you have viruses that are around 20 to 200 nanometers, you have bacteria, the micron scale, you have parasites even larger than that. And each one of them will interact with dendritic cells in a different way. They will have different forms of stimulation 
uh, and they'll result in a different activation of T cells uh, by those dendritic cells. And so what a vaccine is really trying to do is mimic these natural processes that occur when the dendritic cells interact with components of these pathogens by putting them into a controlled, easy to manufacture, not always easy to manufacture, but manufacturable formulation that can deliver the antigen as well as the adjuvant at the same time um, to these dendritic cells so you have control over how they're stimulating those T cells. I like to use immunomodulator instead of adjuvant because sometimes you want to do the opposite effect, sometimes you want anti-inflammatory effect, whereas an adjuvant is typically trying to generate um, a pro-inflammatory effect. So what happens during vaccination? These cells are being exposed to pathogens. It could be through injection, through intramuscular injection, or it could be a wound where you have pathogen coming into a wound, or a scratch. The innate immune system is going to respond rapidly, express those cytokines, try to deal with the issue as much as possible. It, it's going to try and recruit other cell types to come to that site um, by releasing chemokines. Dendritic cells are going to be there. They're also and macrophages are going to come in and respond to those chemokines. They're going to take up those particulates related to the pathogen, process them, and become activated due to any kind of adjuvanting proteins or DNA or components or lipids that are present inside of these different pathogens become activated, migrate to a lymph node where they can interact in higher density and more specifically with T cells to generate those two different types of responses as necessary. Depending on the adjuvants and the effect that's needed, they can go through the cellular immunity process, cytotoxic T cell response, or it can go through the humor response through those B cells, which should then go back and have a mounted response, controlled response that's more selective and specific and usually more powerful um, towards those specific antigens of interest. So of note, this innate immune response happens immediately, whereas this adaptive response can take weeks to occur. Typically, a B cell response takes about two weeks to occur in terms of antibody generation. And so this critical component here is the ability of getting this antigen to the lymph node for this to occur. And so this has been studied in quite a bit of detail in terms of how um, from a site of injection, um, particulates, vaccine components or pathogens can be transferred uh, to the lymph node. And so if you have large components, like a micron sized particle that's injected in the tissue, it can take up to 48 hours for that, say this is a fluorescent microparticle injected into the limb, the hind limbs of a mouse. This is what we're looking at here, it's the hind limbs of a mouse, and this is the draining lymph node um, from that location of injection here. And so this large micron scale particulates are injected into the hind limbs of this mouse, and it takes 48 hours for them to get to the lymph node. And the reason for that is that it was not able to actually traffic through lymphatics, it was too large. And what happens is these dendritic cells and macrophages locally, they engulf the particulate at these locations, and then the cell itself will migrate over time to the lymph node, which takes quite a bit of time. Now, if you actually design your vaccine such that you have components at a nanoscale, around 20 nanometers, 20 to 50 nanometers in diameter, they will traffic immediately through lymphatics directly to the lymph node. So you don't need the cells to actually transfer them to the lymph node. They will go directly there and interact with cells in the lymph node immediately. There are advantages to both of these, uh, but in general, a faster response and more controllable response is usually generated um, by making your particulates inside of your vaccine um, nanoscale, around 20 to 200 nanometers for this to occur. So once they get to the lymph node, um, a lot of things happen. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but keep in mind that the lymph node is a highly complex three-dimensional organ uh, structure that has compartments that are compartmentalized in terms of the cellular components. So you will have a B cell component, the T cell zone. Um, you have interactions between B cells and follicular dendritic cells in a certain zone. Um, and so there's actually a lot of research going on in terms of how you can design your vaccine such that the components will go to specific cell types in these different zones to say get a better B cell response or to get a better T cell response. Uh, in general, the main goal at the moment is to just get your vaccine components to drain into these lymph nodes in order to interact with, with this entire system. But that is, as I pointed out, point that out, that is an active area of interest in how you can target different components or different segments inside the lymph node to get a more precise control over the response that occurs. So shown here is what happens after you have a subcutaneous injection or intramuscular injection, shown here is sub-Q. Uh, you'll have large particles that are present. Uh, these particles are not able to enter into the lymphatic 
uh, network. And so this is a lymphatic vessel shown here. Uh, these particulates are too large to get into the lymphatics, so they have to instead go into the particles. The particles instead have to go into the cells. And the cells, the cells can now um, enter into the lymphatic vessels and traffic to the lymph node to carry out its functions. But if you have, as I mentioned, particulates between 10 to 200 nanometers in size, they can enter directly into lymphatics, uh, drain the lymphatics, interact with cells there. So it may, it may be many times more efficient to have more of your vaccine get to these target cells of interest. Uh, they're very specialized cells within the lymph node that can carry out key functions during a vaccination. Um, and so this can be more efficient by making your, your, your vaccine contain particles or particulates that are of a certain size range to more efficiently get to the lymph node. But again, if it doesn't get there, immune cells will traffic them to that location. So what happens uh, when those dendritic cells actually take up that particulate and how do they actually signal those T cells? Um, so three critical signals occur at the interface or the synapse between a dendritic cell and a T cell. First, I talked already about the MHC, TCR interaction where you have the peptide that was generated from that foreign material being presented to the receptor on the T cell. But second, and very importantly, is you have these effects that are generated by inflammatory stimuli. In this case, most importantly for vaccines, this source of inflammation is going to be the adjuvant. Um, so these are pathogen associated molecular patterns or damage associated molecular patterns. So this could be due to tissue damage or it could be due to the presence of a pathogen that stimulates these dendritic cells to now express these receptors, these co-receptors, as well as to express specific types of, types of cytokines. So the types of cytokines and the repertoire of co-receptors being expressed will synergize with that signal that's coming through the TCR MHC complex to tell these T cells what they need to do. And so this is why it's very critical to select the proper adjuvant, the proper, proper type and mixture of adjuvants to go through the signaling pathway uh, to stimulate those dendritic cells to become activated. Uh, and this goes through signal transduction through different types of they call toll-like receptors primarily. They are located on the surface of the cell as well as on the inside of the cell. That results in transcription factors like NF-kappa B being activated. That results in gene expression, very specific gene expression. You can have a very specific repertoire of cytokines being expressed due to the gene expression induced by a certain type of transcription factor under specific types of conditions induced by the conditions of activation of these dendritic cells. So this is what the adjuvant is trying to do. It's trying to activate these pathways to result in controlled pro-inflammatory stimuli that signals the T cell through the dendritic cell um, what specific kind of response is required. So what happens in that signal one? This is where you have the pathogen or the particulate being taken up into these dendritic cells. They get processed inside of endosomal components. So this is where they get broken down from protein into peptide. Uh, that peptide can then merge with that MHC and then it goes traffic to the surface of the cell and you have that MHC peptide complex presented on the surface of the cell. And we've studied this in quite a bit of detail using model proteins and model antigens. And you'll probably see ovalbumin being used the most that is protein from egg. It's just a really easy to get protein to study this process. And you can mount a nice immune response against it. Um, and this is one thing that's really critical um, is that if you have the whole protein, you have many different locations that can be processed in terms of peptide locations um, that can be presented through MHC. And different people can present different peptides better than others, but there's usually a dominant one. And so in the case of albumin, synfecal, this is just an amino acid sequence spelled out, this synfecal peptide. Um, that is the most efficiently immunodominant MHC1 peptide that's presented on the surface of the cell upon exposure and digestion of albumin. Now keep in mind that that's for MHC1. A different peptide will be required for MHC2. And so that is very important and critical for vaccine design because if you only select this one immunodominant peptide, you're only going to get MHC1 presentation and activation through that pathway. Now, if you have a mixture of MHC1 and MHC2, you will have a different signal signaling pathway. And if you only have an MHC2 peptide, you will have another type of, of signaling pathway. Um, so this just shows here in detail that that synthecal is being presented through MHC1 by complexing with the specific sequences located within inside the binding cleft of MHC here. And of course that can vary depending on the person. Some people are more efficient at presenting synthecal than others. And depending on the 
the antigen source, you will have different affi affinities for the peptides that are generated for this. But keep in mind that it's very important to realize that different peptides bind to MHC1 than MHC2. Uh, and there's a immuno dominant. There are dominant peptides that tend to, best, to bind best inside of the cleft inside these MHCs. So identifying what those are um, are critical for mounting um, a proper vaccine response and going to how you design your vaccine. So shown here is a detailed look inside the cell, uh, going from when you take in um, exogenous. So this is what a, um, an antigen presenting cell is doing in terms of sampling the outside environment. It's taking in these different pathogens. They're being processed inside these endosomal components. And so this entire pathway is all within the endosome. So if it stays inside the endosome, it goes through MHC2. Uh, and so this is very good for generating um, type Th2 responses that are going to interact with CD4 T cells. Now what's unique about dendritic cells in particular is that they can take a pathogen from the outside, but then go through the internal pathway to present through MHC1. So typically most cells just have what's inside their proteins that are inside their cytosol being processed and going through MHC1 presentation. Um, but dendritic cells are very unique and have this pathway called cross-presentation. Uh, where they can take exogenous proteins, process them, and present them through MHC1. This allows them to present a wide repertoire of different types of endogenous and exogenous pathogens uh, to the immune system. And so as a quick reminder, very importantly, uh, depending on whether it goes through MHC1 or MHC2, CD4 or CD8 T cells uh, will be activated. And so this makes the dendritic cells an even better target because by targeting just that one cell type, you can activate CD8s through MHC1 because they have that unique cross-presentation pathway, or you can go through TH2 uh, for CD4 T cell activation. And we can design our vaccines such that they actually go through one pathway or another. Uh, this is kind of an area of up and coming research. Um, and how do you better design a vaccine to generate just polarized response in one direction versus another. This is still an active area of, of interest and dendritic cells are essential components of, of that research. So signal two. Um, so importantly, this signal is highly dependent on the adjuvant. Um, so this is the complex mixture of co-receptors that are interacting at the synapse between those antigen presenting cells and those T cells. So this is just some of these different receptors that are present. I'm not gonna go through all these in detail, but it is important to point out that there are activating um, components such as CD80, CD86, um, as well as inhibitory components. So you'll hear a lot about PDL1 and PD1 pathways and, um, and tumor and tumor research, because that's an anti-inflammatory immunosuppressive pathway. And so either of those pathways can be generated depending on what kind of signal uh, is giving, given to that antigen presenting cell. So hopefully with the, your designed vaccine, you're gonna go through the activation pathway, which is primarily wanting CD40, CD40L, and CD80, CD86 um, activation or presentation. Uh, so how was this actually mediated? As I mentioned before, there are receptors on the surface of the cell as well as on the interior. This is a more detailed look at those receptors. These are called toll-like receptors. They are a series of or type of pattern recognition receptor that can identify very unique molecular components from foreign pathogens. Uh, so for example, flagellin is a the major protein component of of uh, swimming bacteria. That actually has a receptor that, that it binds to, TLR5. Um, TLR4 is very common, common because it binds to LPS, lipopolysaccharide, uh, which is endotoxin, a major component of gram-negative bacterial cell walls. Um, and on the inside, uh, which makes a lot of sense in terms of, of, of design, um, are receptors that bind to and interact with components of intracellular pathogens. So for example, viruses, a lot of viral um, RNA is, is able to bind to toll-like receptors on the interior, a particular single-stranded RNA binds to TLR7, TLR8. Uh, if you have bacteria that lives inside of, of a cell, um, CPG is a common motif found inside of DNA of bacteria that binds to TLR9. So we have pathways on the outside as well as the inside that's evolved to be optimized for interacting with intracellular and extracellular components of pathogens. And so this just shows many of the different pathways that can result uh, in different kinds of um, gene expression. And so, so down here are different types of pro-inflammatory cytokines that can result from these different transcription factors being activated by all these different, many times interconnected pathways. So you can imagine you could actually have 
uh, mixtures of different types of stimulation. So TLR4 synergizes quite well with TLR9 and TLR8, for example, because now you have both an extracellular as well as intracellular pathway being activated um, towards uh, gene expression. So this goes into how you design your vaccines and your mixtures of your adjuvants. You can have mixing and matching of those TOLAC receptor activation pathways. So what are these adjuvants doing? As I mentioned, they're critical, of course, for those co-receptor expressions, um, as well as cytokine expression. But what's the end result? What is it actually doing? It does many practical things. It makes your vaccine more effective, essentially. Um, lower dosages are required. It may take lower cost to make your vaccine. It makes it more effective at stimulating both the innate as well as the adaptive immune system. Um, you can have enhanced antibody production, um, enhanced presentation through MHC2, um, you have enhanced generation of cytotoxic T cells, and very importantly, you can have better memory responses being generated. So the type of vaccine, the type of adjuvant that you pick for the vaccine is, is really critical and is completely necessary and important component, even though it's gotten a lot of negative press by some people um, um, recently. And so there, this is just an outline of the different types of adjuvants that, you, that you'll see. You have stimulators that bind to those receptors, like toll-like receptors. I didn't talk about these many other types, the types that don't require a receptor that bind to proteins uh, inside the cell cytosol. Um, you have delivery vehicles. Um, so not just the molecular components considered um, adjuvants, you can have an entire vehicle considered to be uh, an adjuvant. I'll talk a little bit about that in the upcoming slide. But the end result is these signals all come together to have an enhanced stimulation of the innate as well as the adaptive immune system. Primarily, we're focusing on the adaptive immune system for these, for these vaccine components um, in order to generate these interactions between dendritic cells and T cells um, and to generate a good memory response. So there's a wide range of different types of adjuvants present. This is just a nice little chart um, showing licensed adjuvants over the years, as well as some that have undergone clinical trials. And you'll see, st um, very strangely here, um, aluminum salts, alum, has been one of our only adjuvants for for many, many, many years. Uh, so from the early 1900s to the late 1900s, alum was pretty much the only vaccine adjuvants that was approved. Uh, since then, we've shifted to many others that have come along. I'll talk about some of these in a little bit more detail. Uh, but shown here are some of the ones that are either under active investigation or use at the moment. This is alum. Um, Aluminum hydroxide can come in uh, various forms and formulations. You can have particulate forms. You can have these crystalline forms that are more rod-like. Um, there are a lot of different formulations for, for alum that are used uh, clinically. Um, CPG, um, this is a, a mimic of the DNA um, uh, from bacteria that stimulates TLR9. Imicromod is a small molecule adjuvant that mimics uh, single-stranded RNA from, from viruses. Um, we have polyIC with TLR3. We have MPLA. MPLA is very interesting, and that is actually derived from the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria that is typically fairly toxic. It's called endotoxin, but it's been chemically modified uh, to decrease the toxicity. So the MPLA um, is actually the non-toxic form of lipid A from the cell wall of bacteria that is non-toxic. And it's a component of, I believe it's approved in Europe uh, for several vaccines. And it, I, I believe it has not been approved yet in, in the United States. Uh, flagellum, again, is uh, the component of um, the swimming components of the proteins from bacterium uh, that can also be used for TLR5 um, agonists. So you'll see there's a mixture of synthetic as well as natural adjuvants that are, that are currently uh, in use. I want to take one moment to, to talk a little bit about alum because it's so critical. Shown here are just some of the formulations that incorporate um, alum or some formulation of alum um, as an adjuvant. You'll see they're being used by many different companies, GSK, Merck, all using alum in a variety of different vaccines. Um, alum is very good at generating a Th2 and humoral immune response. And it has multiple mechanisms of activation. Uh, it's thought to actually induce local tissue damage, so it signals through damp. Um, it's activate, able to activate very nicely dendritic cells and has some unique um, non-receptor-mediated membrane interactions. There's some of the more recent uh, findings in terms of how it's um, activated, uh, activating. Um, so what's really interesting is that to this day, we still don't fully understand how alum works. Um, and so just this year, we had another paper that came out in the Nature Medicine. In Nature Medicine. Um, this is from the Daryl Irvine Group, which is a, a immunoengineering group at, at MIT, just showing that how if you, if you change the interaction between the, the antigen and the alum, uh, 
you can actually um, enhance um, immune responses. So you can have slow release. So you can have um, co-uptake of the uh, alum particulates with the, the antigen more uh, precisely, um, resulting in difference in enhanced immune responses. So there's still a lot of research going into how alum works, uh, but in general, it is the most used um, adjuvant to date. It's still used today um, and is very effective at getting, getting a humoral and Th2 immune response. Not very useful for Th1 response, which many times what you want for treating many types of uh, viruses. Uh, and so this is, these are the, the carriers I was mentioning I was going to talk a little bit about. Um, so it's come into prevalence recently, um, these nanocarriers. So these are nanoparticulates. They're, they kind of mimic the structure and size of viruses. Um, and they're able to carry both the antigen as well as the adjuvant at the same time in the same location and dual deliver those to those antigen presenting cells. And so that has been found to be highly advantageous for generating a controlled immune response, decreasing dosages. Um, and so you'll see many formulations under, develop for this, under the development for this. Uh, liposomes, verisomes, these are derived directly from viral proteins that self-assemble. MF59 is a squalene um, surfactant-based formulation that can bind and present antigen. Um, it's been developed and used in many different formulations um, by Novartis. Uh, ISCOMs are uh, these cage-like um, structures that can carry antigen, and many um, are developing synthetic materials, um, such as synthetic polymers that can assemble um, um, or be cross-linked um, into particulates that are nanoscale that can present antigen and hold adjuvant for delivery. This is an area of research um, for my group is developing these synthetic polymers that can um, function as vaccine carriers by delivering both the adjuvant and the antigen uh, in the same particulate. And this is just one example of something that we worked on. Um, this is a TLR78 agonist, CLO75. It's a derivative of imiquimod, which I showed on that previous um, slide. This is a polymerosome, and so CLO75 is not very water soluble. Um, and so, using these vaccine adjuvants in terms of nanocarrier, you can have something that's insoluble now become soluble in this particulate form. And you can co-deliver it with different types of antigen. Like in this case, we use an HIV gag um, antigen for the, this is what the particles look like. Um, they're designed to be highly stable. So these particulates um, and nanoparticle based uh, vaccine formulations can be designed to uh, last in room temperature for a long period of time and remain stable. And very importantly, they enhance the delivery inside of those dendritic cells. This is showing enhanced delivery inside of adult as well as infant neonatal dendritic cells. Uh, and this is work that I did in collaboration um, with Ofer Levy uh, and David Dowling. These are my collaborators at um, the Precision Vaccines Program at Harvard um, Boston. Medical School in Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, they have access to a wide range of novel adjuvants. Um, this is how we got access to CLO75 a long time ago. Um, I just wanted to point them out because they've been really critical for our ongoing work and they are currently working on several vaccines for, for COVID-19. It just highlights the importance of adjuvant development in terms of future vaccine um, design. And the final signal I want to talk about, of course, is also adjuvant dependent, that's the cytokine response. And so depending on how those antigen presenting cells are activated, what types and components of the pathogen is presented to them. Um, if you take components of, of parasites versus bacteria versus viruses, um, you'll have different types of stimulation of these dendritic cells, which results in different kinds of cytokine expression, resulting in different types of pathways of immune stimulation. So Th1, Th2, regulatory, and this is all dependent on the signals that are given to those dendritic cells shown here in the middle. So this is just a summary of everything that I, I talked about in that previous section. Um, essentially, you have these dendritic cells, um, type of immune cell derived from um, progenitors and the bone marrow. They're able to survey peripheral tissue um, in an immature state. They'll take up your pathogen or your vaccine and tissues, which causes them to be stimulated and different pathways, which results in polarizing towards certain types of immune responses, Th1, Th2, Th1, Th2 combined, um, Treg response uh, in terms of regulatory response. Um, and in, if you look at this in more detail, um, we have all these different kinds of cytokines being involved, um, co-receptor stimulation being involved uh, in terms of how they're activated. And this really comes down critically to the types of immunostimulation that they receive. Um, typically, this is done by a pathogen, by some molecular composition. And in the case of a vaccine, you can take natural components as well as make synthetic forms in, in the form of an adjuvant to make this entire process function. 
So I wanna quickly um, focus a little bit on humoral responses because there's so much press lately uh, talking about antigen responses, how they're generated and, and how they're important uh, for vaccines. And to be honest, we are most effective at generating um, humoral responses in terms of our vaccines. We're still not very good at TH1 responses and cell immediate responses for our vaccines. Uh, so this is just an example shown here uh, of an injection uh, from a vaccine causing local tissue damage. You have recruitment of immune cells to location. They'll take out the antigen and the adjuvant. These immune cells, like dendritic cells, will traffic to the lymph nodes. Well, they interact uh, with a variety of different cell types in those compartments within the lymph node. So now we have interaction between B cells, follicular dendritic cells, and T helper cells, uh, which allows a very efficient um, anti anti antibody generation. Um, so this is what you'll see initially at that 14 day period, you'll have this spike in antibody generation, it takes about 14 days. And very importantly, if, depending on whether you're using a serological assay to determine whether or not someone's been exposed to a virus, if you're looking for antibodies, it takes two weeks in terms of getting that response before you'd be able to have detectable levels of antibodies present. So that's why we have this PCR system where you can have immediate detection of uh, genetic material from the virus, which tells you immediately if someone's been infected versus a serological assay, which takes uh, into account antibodies, but that takes, there's a two week gap between when those two different assays are gonna be useful. And so towards the end here, you're gonna have declining immune response because it's, it's carried out its function. Now the immune system shuts down. Otherwise you can have uh, toxic immune response from, from your own self cells. So it has to control itself. Goes back down during this process of memory cells are generated. And some of those plasma cells that express those antibodies are now going to migrate to the bone marrow to reside for a longer period of time. So then we typically have a booster administration um, where you have another injection, you have a similar pathway as what happened before, but now you already have some of those memory cells present. You'll have a faster, more immediate response. You'll have higher generation of antibodies, and you're able to control, hopefully to prevent a full infection from occurring. So the second response is gonna be much stronger, it's gonna be way faster, and you can actually generate more memory, memory cells, um, and it should be longer lasting. So some vaccines require this booster to get that secondary response to function, and some vaccines that are still, mostly still under investigation, um, only require one, one injection. That will be the goal, is to have just one administration. Um, currently, the main vaccine that can do that is BCG. Um, vaccine given against tuberculosis only requires one administration at the time of birth to generate a lasting response. Um, and so, importantly about these um, antibody responses is the type of antibody present is, is very important. It's indicative of the stage of the immune response. It's also indicative of efficacy. So the first type of antibody that's going to be generated is IgM. Uh, and so if you're uh, detecting IgM antibodies, that's telling you um, that you have not had a strong helper T cell response because after this helper T cell response, you're going to get a process called class switching, where these antibodies go from one type IgM to these different types of more specialized antibodies that carry out different functions. And that's dependent on those cytokines that are going to be expressed by those helper T cells. So if you have a good immune response generated by your vaccine, you want to activate those CD4 T cells. You want to get um, cytokine expression that's going to affect those B cells to start to result in class switching, resulting in specialized antibodies that can now carry out more, more effective responses against um, the infection. So you see some of these are are specialized for mucosal. Some of these are going to be very effective um, against viruses like IgG is going to be the one that's going to be highest concentration in blood that's circulating to present viral infection. And so these very specialized um, antibodies tell you that you have a good, typically a good vaccine response, response occurring. And so that's something to also look at um, when you're looking at these serological assays. Are you looking at IgG? Are you looking at IgM? Um, and that can be very critical. So if you're detecting IgG at a very early stage, um, but before the two week time point, that suggests that you might have antibodies present from a prior exposure uh, to a similar pathogen. So that's one of the worries right now is that sometimes some of these antibodies that we're detecting, if they're IgG too soon before the two week time point, maybe we're seeing responses to other coronaviruses and not necessarily to, um, the most recent one responsible for COVID-19. So that's something to keep in mind. The type of antibody that you're getting is very indicative of the stage of the response and how effective the vaccine is and the type of exposure that the patient has, has, has seen already. Um, and I cannot stress this enough is that
antibodies, the quality of those antibodies is critical. Antibodies do not mean that you have protection. So you hear a lot about herd immunity and where you have some people have antibodies now present in, in society due to their prior exposure uh, to, to, the, to the virus. So maybe they got rid of the virus. Uh, we don't know if they have lasting um, antibody responses. We don't know if all those antibodies are actually neutralizing. We don't know if some of those antibodies are ineffective. And also these antibodies can also be pathogenic. So there's actually good types of antibodies for vaccine response and there's actually pathological responses. Um, and one I'll, I'll pick out very importantly is that those, those dendritic cells and APCs, uh, one mechanism they use to take up the viruses for processing them um, is through FC receptors that bind to antibodies. So the antibody will make a complex with the target, like the, the virus, it will bind to the virus. And the APC will come along and bind to the end of that antibody and take in, it makes it more efficient through opsonization to take in that virus. Now, if that's a neutralizing antibody, the antibody will be ineffective. Like it'll be binding a location that's critical for the virus to function. If it is not neutralizing, it can actually have the opposite effect. It now makes it more easy for the virus to get into a cell because now these dendritic cells can now bind through these, these antibodies to take in the virus and process them. But if the virus is not inhibited, it's not neutralized, it can now infect that cell type. So it can actually be detrimental. But in general, um, these antibodies can have extremely effective responses in terms of activating or enhancing T cell responses. Um, in a, many, in a variety of different ways. I'm not gonna go into all these uh, details here, um, but I wanted to outline um, that critically that it's very important to realize do you have effective neutralizing antibodies being generated by your vaccine? Or is it pathological or is it ineffective? And so keep in mind that even though you have antibodies present throughout the society, um, you might not have or not, might be progressing towards herd immunity if these vaccine um, generated um, antibodies are not effective. And that's one reason why herd immunity is mostly associated with an effective vaccine, because it means that you have neutralizing antibodies being generated, not ineffective um, antibodies being generated that can happen um, without a, a properly designed vaccine. So how does this vaccine knowledge in terms of immunology, how does that impact design and strategy when you make a new vaccine? Um, so I've talked about the Th1 pathway and the Th2 pathway in very, minimalist fun minim minimalist way. Um, so uh, I want to point out that this is an extremely complex system where you have many things interacting at the same time, many different processes still being discovered. And so this is essentially a better picture of what a TH1, TH2 response looks like, which many times is occurring at the same time. Um, and so how have we dealt with this complexity um, in the past. And so we've needed vaccines for a long time, long before we understood all these immunological mechanisms. So typically the, the typical pathway for making a vaccine is quite simple. Um, you take the antigen, uh, you can either take the whole organism or you can take some component of it, um, either an inactivated form, a protein or just a peptide epitope and you mix it uh, with an adjuvant that you have already made. Typically, many different companies already have proprietary um, adjuvants like MF59 for Novartis, and you make a formulation. You might fine tune the formulation a little bit by adding a little more or less of the antigen adjuvant combination. But essentially, that's if you don't understand the immunology, that's kind of where we're stuck. Um, so from that stage on, you inject this into an animal, uh, typically mice and non-human primates, and you look at the output. Uh, and so you see, do you have a prophylactic response, a therapeutic response, TH1, TH2? Are you getting immunity? Are you getting tolerance? Are you getting cytotoxic? Are you getting humoral? These are things you look for. But typically, you're stuck modifying these few components because many times it's a mysterious black box, what is going on in terms of the immune response. So this is why there's so much research still ongoing to understand what is the virus doing? What is the immune response to the virus? What is the effective immune response to the virus? Can we take this information from this black box and actually use that to rationally design uh, the vaccine? And so that is where rational vaccine design comes in. It's what my lab works on and many other labs are working on. And this black box, this mysterious black box that was being researched now to try and understand how COVID-19 is, is functioning. But this approach, this overall approach, has come from classically uh, Pasteur's principles. Uh, so, of course, Louis Pasteur, a very famous microbiologist, um, 
Um, many credit him with designing or coming up with the, the key principles of vaccination. Um, he was responsible for making an, a live attenuated vaccine against um, rabies. Um, and he did that um, by isolating, inactivating, and re-injecting. And that is the three principles of classic vaccine design. Um, so he isolated the virus. Uh, he inactivated it um, by injecting it into rabbits. And it allowed the, the vaccine, or sorry, the virus to adapt to the rabbit. As it adapted to the rabbit, it became ineffective at infecting humans. So you could then extract it from the, this different uh, location, in this case, rabbits, it's a different environment, um, and now injected into a human. And now the human is not infected, but many of the key components of the, of the virus is still there, allowing a strong immune response. So that's the classical method um, of generating a live attenuated vaccine. And so Louis Pasteur, he's um, credited um, with generating that strategy. And so now we have many, many different forms of vaccination. Um, so live attenuated is the one I just mentioned, but we have whole inactivated. That's where you take, um, you modify, you can denature the proteins, you can kill the bacterium such that they cannot infect. And so that's an inactivated vaccine. Um, you have ones where you synthesize different components. You can have a recombinant. Um, one of the newer ones that's currently under investigation are DNA and RNA type vaccines. This is where you actually trans transfect the host cells so that the immune cells actually express the antigen inside the patient. So instead of injecting the antigen, your immune cells now express the antigen to allow exposure for, for immune response. So all of these different methods are currently under investigation for, for, for treating COVID-19. So here's the five revolutions, I would say, in vaccination um, that have happened since, uh, since the beginning. Uh, first, as I mentioned before, you have attenuation, where you have the live form, but it's just no longer able to infect the host um, because you have allowed, allowed it to evolve and change and adapt to a different environment. So this non-ideal environment now allows it to live, uh, now to be injected into the, to the host without causing an, an actual disease. Um, Next stage was inactivation, where you actually killed the bacterium or you denatured proteins within the, the virus such that they cannot uh, infect. So you inactivated it, so it's no longer live, considered live, even though viruses aren't really alive. Um, um, they're just inactivated in this case. Next, we have cell culture. This is where we learned that instead of having to inject, of course, like into the rabbit, we can now do this process in vitro, in culture conditions. So now you can grow the, the viruses, the bacteria in the culture control condition, um, make it or allow it to adapt to a different environment. And now you have a different way of making these live attenuated um, vaccines that's more um, effective and high throughput. The next stage was genetic engineering. You can genetically modify uh, viruses uh, to change their genetic components so they can still express some antigens, um, but they're no longer able to cause pathology. Um, so some examples of that is hepatitis B vaccine, HPV um, for genetic engineering. Uh, and finally, now this new stage um, where we're actually trying to have more control of the immune response that we get. Many of these are, are generated by just putting everything in there from the virus or the bacterium or just seeing what kind of response we get and trying to fine tune the adjuvant. And what we're currently working on now is how do we from the ground up design the vaccine for a particular immune cell function? How do we cause certain dendritic cells or certain um, APC populations to carry out certain functions that can direct the immune response in one direction or another? And so classically, these responses have been very good for generating Th2 and humor responses. They have not been so good for us in terms of generating uh, TH1 responses. So now we're still trying to figure out the best ways of getting these cytotoxic responses in a controlled fashion, which has a lot of implications, not just for infectious disease, but also for cancer. So what are these key considerations that you think about when you're designing the vaccine? Uh, first, do you want prophylactic or therapeutic? Are you preventing a disease or are you treating a disease that's already been established? Um, are you trying to reduce the chance of infection or are you trying to address something that's already established? The patient already been infected or the patient had cancer they're trying to get rid of? Um, do you want a cell-mediated response or do you want a humoral response? Um, is the pathogen within human cells or is it going to be mostly found in the exterior? Does preventing the virus from infecting the cell, is that enough to prevent the pathology? Can you actually generate a strong antibody response in order to address the disease? Uh, and finally, which is one critical area, is the target population. Um, you'll find that different Component, components and segments of the, of the population have different immune responses. So we generally can be divided into neonatal stage, infant stage, adolescent stage, adult stage, and the elderly stage. 
each one of these segments has different immune responses and can respond very differently to a vaccine. And also, has the patient actually been exposed to something similar before? Um, the vaccine can have different eff efficacy if a patient has already been exposed to another type of coronavirus, uh, for example. And this also comes into account if you're detecting antibodies. Maybe you're detecting antibody from a prior exposed exposure to a different coronavirus pathogen. Um, and then you get down to the details. What adjuvants do you want to use? Do you want to have a TH1 or a TH2 response? Um, again, this comes back to, is it intracellular? Um, toxicity considerations. Is there any risk for having a cytokine storm, um, depending on the mixtures and concentration of the adjuvants being used? Uh, the antigen selection. What is that immunodominant um, antigen and that immunodominant epitope and peptide that you want to give? Um, I didn't talk about this, but there's also not just protein-based antigens, there's also lipid-based antigens. Is this going to be important? It could be important for many bacterial infections. Um, and are these viral, viable antigen targets accessible uh, to an antibody response? Um, is an antibody response going to be sufficient? Uh, do you need to have a different kind of antigen being delivered such you have a TH1 response versus a TH2? And so I want to quickly go over the importance of taking into consideration the variability across the human population. So not just through that MHC variability, but also depending on the sex, the age, the comorbidity, and the prior pathogen exposure. So this is something that's coming up quite a bit with COVID-19. Uh, patients that have comorbidities, like prior heart conditions, hypertension, they are actually seeing worse cases. And they may have differences in terms of how the, the vaccine will function. And this is mainly because they have different types of inflammatory immune responses that could be due to any of these different um, issues, sex, age, or their, their pathology. And so this is just one example here for actually autoimmunity um, in terms of women and men. There's actually a huge difference. Uh, women are actually driven by an IL-6 pathway for autoimmunity. Men are driven by interferon gamma. Uh, this here uh, is a principal component analysis, a network analysis of how cytokines are interacting and driving immune responses in men and women of different ages. And what you see is that it differs between men and women. It also differs between men across different ages. What are the key cytokines and signaling pathways um, that are critical for mounting these immune responses? Um, and so this is something that has to be taken into account. And so I mentioned BCG before. BCG is only useful for neonates. It is ineffective in adults. Um, there are a lot of vaccines that are ineffective in infants, but are effective in adults. And so this is a perfect example here um, is the vaccine schedule that's, that you see. So if you've had a, an infant or a baby, I've actually recently gone through this because I just had a baby last year. Um, you see that there's only certain times when a certain vaccine is given. And it's not be given at these different times because of danger of giving too many at once. It is due to the fact that they're ineffective at certain stages of development. And that's because the immune system changes. Um, fairly rapidly at the early stage. Um, so at the time of birth to, the, to a one-year-old, there's a quite a drastic change in terms of the immune response that can occur. And so most vaccines are simply not effective within the first two months of birth. Um, BCG um, can be given at the time of birth. HPV is given very early on, but others typically are not. And so this results in a window of vulnerability where infants can get to very dangerous diseases. Um, but they have no protection uh, and the vaccines will not work. So this is why you need to keep your infants away from uh, large crowds at the early stages uh, up to like six months of age, um, typically best probably up to 12 months when they can be vaccinated against measles um, because there are no effective vaccines for that age range. And so uh, this is due to deficiencies of the neonatal immune system it actually comes down to their dendritic cells functioning differently, as well as a lot of immunosuppressive um, agents being present. Um, and so there's a lot of research going into developing adjuvants uh, that can address these issues. And so one key thing here to look at is alum is actually fairly ineffective uh, for newborns. So this is the response that you'll get um, in, at different amounts of, of agonists. In this case, you're giving um, alum. This is the cytokine response that you're getting. You see it's very weak at these lower concentrations, lower dosages. Um, but in adults, you can give very much lower amounts to have a stronger effect um, in terms of cytokine expression. And so there are certain adjuvants under development, like the CL75 I mentioned before, that um, can address these deficiencies 
of a neonatal immune system, which actually is quite deficient in a TH1 response. So they're very susceptible to intracellular pathogens and various viruses that um, require a TH1 response to get rid of them. Um, infants are, or, or neonates are not very good at addressing these kinds of, of uh, pathogens. And so what are some of the limitations um, of our current vaccine strategies? As I mentioned before, we're quite good at generating antibodies. So these are success rates for vaccines that have been developed. So we have a lot of things we've done uh, treated very well. And these are all usually antibody dependent. Um, typically ones that require T cell responses uh, in terms of TH1 responses, we are not very good at generating such uh, effective immune, immune responses and vaccines against those. This is an area of active investigation. How do we enhance our TH1 response to get better vaccines? And it's not just um, generating that TH1 response. Um, we also want to generate subunit vaccines. We want these artificial vaccines that take key components because we can rationally design these vaccines and we can manufacture them. We want to manufacture them rapidly and precisely. Uh, and when you do that, you have to take key components. You take that immunodominant peptide, you take that key antigen, you put that into your formulation and you mass produce that. Um, you put them inside nanoparticulates like I shown here that we work on. But what you're missing are many different components that are present in the live attenuated form of that vaccine. There's RNA, there's DNA, there's lipids. All these things are present in that live attenuated uh, vaccine or that inactivated vaccine that are not in our subunit rapid vaccines. And so that's actually one area of interest for my lab is what about the lipids that are missing? Um, we try to incorporate in a precise way controllable amounts of the lipids that are missing from these synthetic vaccines to make them more effective uh, and work similar to, to these live attenuated vaccines. Uh, and so I recently actually um, have um, written a review article uh, with my collaborator at Boston Children's Hospital, David Dowling, that goes over a lot of the um, a lot of this information, um, as well as the future direction of vaccination. Um, so if you're interested in this, I recommend looking for this. It should be published within the next month or so. It's currently in press, but it goes over some of the future um, pathways of designing vaccines, um, taking big data into account, uh, reverse engineering vaccines, developing new adjuvants, um, making vaccines for tumors, for example, combination vaccines, as well as my area of interest specifically is um, immunoengineering where we make designed or carefully rationally designed delivery systems to target dendritic cells and specific cell types. And so a lot of interest has gone into these different delivery systems and there's many different types of delivery systems that we can use to, um, to um, enhance vaccination. And so I'm not gonna go into all of these, but there are many different review articles um, that can be found um, to go into these in more detail. And so finally, this last section, I just wanna go over some specifics for, for SARS, um, particularly for COVID-19. So what are, our, uh, what are the current objectives um, for making um, a vaccine against um, COVID-19? Uh, first and foremost, we want to ensure safety of the vaccine. Um, so there have been some complications that have been seen with vaccine for SARS, other types of um, coronaviruses and SARS in the past. Um, some lung damage has been developed um, and some of these vaccines were not effective against certain age groups. Uh, so we need to make sure that these vaccines are safe and effective um, and in patients of a variety of different ages. We need to make sure we're getting long-term protection. Um, we have seen some early data demonstrating that we can get uh, at least naturally in the population some antibody generation. But these antibodies, of course, are gonna be generated against different components of, of the virus. What is the key component of the virus to block? Uh, we know that the virus actually interacts with ACE2 uh, receptors on cell surfaces. Um, these spike proteins will bind um, to ACE2, resulting in endocytosis or uh, more efficient entry into the cells. So if we make an antibody, um, should we target those spike proteins? Is that gonna be more effective? These are the kind of things we're, we're looking into. And, and really critical is protecting our elderly, um, particularly COVID-19 has um, um, higher rates of death and morbidity and those over the age of 50, as well as those that have comorbidities like diabetes and hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Um, so these are the kind of things we have to think about um, in designing the vaccine. Is it gonna be one or maybe we have to make multiple vaccines for different age groups, for example. 
So this is a typical vaccine development schedule. This is what you'd expect to have typically. It's about a 16 year process, um, classically. Um, it goes from academic research to understand the virus, preclinical studies, uh, then we go into in animals, then we do phase one, two, three trials, then we have to develop the infrastructure to mass produce the vaccine, um, and then get it approved and distributed. That takes about 16 years, typically. Um, now we're trying to speed this up. We're trying to get a vaccine by early next year. So you see how drastic a change that is. Um, a lot of people say, well, why is it taking so long? That's how long it typically takes to make a safe vaccine that you know is effective. Um, that's going to make neutralizing antibodies, for example, in the large population. Um, we're trying our best. Well, not, I'm not particularly working on this myself, but um, in general, researchers are trying their best to speed this process up as much as possible, but you have to make sure that's going to make effective neutralizing antibodies. And so we've gone over today some of the many difficulties that go into that that you have to think about. You can't just rush something like this so you have an ineffective vaccine, a lot of wasted, re wasted resources, as well as potential for making something that is uh, unsafe. So uh, these are the many different vaccines that are currently under development for, for COVID-19. We have mRNA, DNA, recombinant, uh, the spike protein, as I mentioned, is a key area of interest, the targeting that spike protein. Um, there's live attenuated vaccines, there's inactivated vaccines being developed right now. And so these are the key things that are taken into to account for, for COVID-19 in particular is that it's apparent we probably need a strong CD8 T cell response, and we'd also like to have a neutralizing response. Which one's going to be best? Which one is going to win? Do we need a combination of the two? Uh, these are the kind of things that are going to have to be worked out, um, particularly in animal trials. Um, hopefully that works out in the, in the phase one, phase two, and phase three trial, clinical trials. But also keep in mind that we have to look out for pathology that can occur. Um, we have viruses hijacking the immune system, um, making, as I mentioned before, more effective um, infection of cells by going to that FC receptor interaction. Um, if, the, if the antibody is not neutralizing um, or causing immunopathology through enhanced inflammation. So uh, if you have too much IL-6 production is associated with um, cytokine storms. Uh, these are um, heightened immune responses that can result in overstimulation and in fairly rapid uh, death. So here are the current stages of developing a vaccine, particularly one for a virus-like particle, um, virus particulate. Um, first stage, map the genome. Can we make a genetically engineered um, pathway or do we need to adapt? Um, make an inactivated vaccine. So this pathway, you have a weakened virus, you kill the virus, or you isolate components of the virus um, in order to make a formulation. Or we could go the genetic route um, and make these DNA vaccines where you have a plasmid that's gonna cause expression of the, of the viral proteins um, inside the host itself. So we have this formulation that we have generated and now we have to test it. Um, starting with testing in lab culture, um, then you go to animal testing, uh, is it toxic? Yes, then you stop and go back to the drawing board. Is it not toxic? Um, you can go on. Does it prompt the immune response um, that you're looking for? Is it generating antibodies that are effective? If yes, then you can go on to clinical trials in humans. No, then you need to stop testing, go back and figure out what was wrong and try to get those neutralizing antibodies generated. Um, so we go through various phases with more and more numbers of test subjects, 10 to 100, hundreds, and then the thousands. And then you get to the stage where you want to mass produce this to test, to, to distribute out to the general population. And so looking at this entire process, you see why it takes um, so long. And there's so many things that can go wrong um, along the way that cause you to go back to the drawing boards or to re reassess your formulation. So these are the various companies that are currently making vaccines for COVID-19. Um, you'll see that a lot of them are now using this newer RNA and DNA vaccine technology, as well as some of the more classical ones. I'll, I'll give an example of one today. Um, but yeah, we have live attenuated, we have viral vector recombinant DNA vaccines, mRNA vaccines, all under development currently um, to try and address COVID-19. And in a little bit more detail, what can go wrong? Um, this is this process called antibody-dependent enhancement of viral infection. So remember, viruses have multiple ways of infecting and getting into cells. Um, they can bind to receptors. Um, they can fuse with the membrane, or they can use our own FC receptors that have the ability to bind to antibodies that are bound to the surface of the, of the virus particle. So if you're antibody, you're generating with your neutralizing antibody generated 
if your antibody that's generated is not neutralizing, sorry, uh, and is binding to the virus, and the virus is still able to carry out many functions, this will potentially enhance the ability to infect certain cells. Um, so we have to look out for that. And in particular, we need to look out for this effect of the cytokine storm, where you have a heightened immune response that can result in rapid death. Um, IL-6 is uh, one of the telltale cytokines that are involved in this. And we have seen this uh, currently in the clinic in terms of responses to, to COVID-19. So quickly, I want to go over two um, new or recently uh, published papers. Um, this first paper um, goes over kind of the current status of what we think might be good vaccine targets um, for um, this coronavirus. Uh, this is a pre-proof, so it's been accepted into the journal cell. It has not come out officially yet, but you can download this pre-proof. Uh, and so the key finding here um, was through an investigation of patients within the general population that have been exposed to COVID-19 and recovered. Um, so those, well, first, really interestingly, is that those have not been exposed, they do have T cells, both CD4s so, and CD8s, so TH1 and TH2, that were able to respond um, to, to uh, COVID-19. And they think it's due to prior exposure to all these different types of coronaviruses. So remember, there's four major types of coronaviruses that are just part of the general common cold. Um, and so there is some um, cross-reactivity, which is, this is good for us, cross-reactivity between some of these older coronaviruses um, and the one responsible for COVID-19. And so in detail, they looked at what parts of the virus are actually able to generate an immune response through both the CD4 and for CD8s. And they found that 100% of those that had a nice immune response generated antibodies um, against uh, CD4 epitopes. Um, and pretty much many different types of proteins coming from the virus were able to induce these responses. And this S protein here, the spike protein, actually generated a, a large majority of these, which is, which is quite uh, promising. Um, but we also see that those that were able to deal with the, the virus actually generated quite a bit of a CD8 uh, TH1 immunity, immune response. So this tells us that there, it might be important to have some TH1 um, peptides or immune um, um, antigens present inside of vaccines going forward. This is a more detailed look at the repertoire of different um, antibody responses that were generated to these different components. Um, so this is looking at the CD4, uh, TH2 antigen selection. And so these are the different types of antigens present within inside of the virus. Uh, and you see the extent of the response. So at the, type, at the top here, we have those that have uh, been exposed to COVID-19 before. And you see these are the immunodominant um, antigens shown here. Um, and su suggesting that the spike protein would be a good target you know, to get a good vaccine against, potentially get a good vaccine against the virus. And you see that those that have not been exposed, they have way weaker responses. So note, note the difference in the scale here. They have much weaker responses, but they do have some responses to some of these proteins uh, naturally. And this is looking at the CD8 repertoire. Um, so remember, there's different peptides, immunodominant peptides for CD8 versus uh, CD4. And we see these are the critical uh, components of the virus responsible for getting those good CD8 responses. But we do see that in general, these responses are weaker um, compared to what we saw for CD4. Um, but again, the spike protein is in there. So this suggests that the spike protein uh, may be a, a good target uh, in general for getting um, CD8 um, and CD4 responses. In terms of vaccine design, in, you might want to use a larger segment. Uh, you might want, not want to use a specific peptide epitope, for example. Um, you might want to have a larger protein present that could have major, uh, a mixture of the different epitopes resulting in CD8 and CD4 responses. So this is how you might think about a vaccine uh, in terms of these, these results. Um, and finally, there has been uh, an, effect, an effective vaccine in primates discussed recently. So this paper just came out in science. So I wanted to quickly go over two figures from this paper um, that kind of brings together some of the stuff that I've talked about uh, today and assessing whether or not this might be an effective uh, vaccine in humans. Uh, so this is an assessment of the genome um, of, that, of the virus um, and looking at, importantly, the pathway for making an inactivated vaccine. So this is an inactivated whole vaccine, um, whole virus um, vaccine. Um, so this is the pathway they went through in vitro to um, inactivate the virus. And this is what the, the actual vaccine looks like. You see that there are virus, virus particles present there. These are the proteins present um, in the virus. 
um, that are incorporated inside of this vaccine. Um, and this is what happens um, when injected inside of prim non-human primates. Um, they have two different dosages as well as a sham, so they did not receive uh, the vaccine. Um, and there's a dose-dependent effect, six mic microgram versus a 1.5 microgram dosage. And you see, days after infection, are you generating um, injection of the, of the vaccine? Are you generating antibodies? And so we have IgG. And so IgG, of course, tells you that there was class switching occurring. Um, and we have 14 days, which is when you start to expect to see larger amounts of antibody being generated. And we have very nice, strong antibody responses. Um, but are those antibodies neutralizing? So this is an assessment of whether or not those antibodies are neutralizing. So remember, this is a critical part of assessing whether the vaccine worked. It doesn't mean anything at all, really, if you're generating antibodies, if those antibodies are not going to be neutralizing in terms of vaccine design. Um, and so then they look at the viral load. So they can take samples from the throats as well as the anal swab and look at um, what is the amount of virus present in terms of looking at the RNA present. And you'll see this decline that went down by day seven. Um, and so also you have a very nice um, effect of the vaccine here. So you see the placebo and the sham, you don't have any effect, you have a high viral load, whereas when the vaccine is given, you have a very nice, nice response. Um, and so importantly, this is present uh, in, the, in, the, in the lung. This effect is present in the lung. You don't have high viral loads um, in the lung um, at these different dosages of the vaccine being administered. And so this is showing you, this is a very promising uh, vaccine, at least in primates. And this is why a lot of people are getting excited by these results and why they're hoping to take this or in currently planning to take this on to uh, the next stage, um, which would be the phase one um, trials. And so I'm going to end here. Um, and acknowledge the people um, um, that are in my lab that um, carry out some similar research in terms of vaccine delivery system development, um, as well as acknowledge um, our funding sources and collaborators um, that has con have contributed to our work as well as the work of others in the area of addressing infectious disease. Um, and thank you um, for listening. Um, and I'd be happy to answer questions um, if you feel the need to email me or contact me um, after seeing this presentation. And I hope that the references that I have listed uh, will be of use. Uh, thank you.